Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Majors and Quinn Booksellers. Uh, tonight is a very special event for us, uh, not only because we have a great author here, but because it is a lit punch event. Does anyone know what that means? No. Lit, lit punch event. Um, you've heard of the coffee cards, right? To encourage people to buy coffee. Well, <coughs> lit punch events are encouraging people to attend book readings here in town. And they are sponsored by Coffee House Press, Milkweed, The Loft, and Grey Wolf, as well as Majors and Quinn. And every time you attend an event, you get a punch. And you buy a book, you get another punch. Twelve punches, you get a $15 gift card. And, uh, and you're, you're supporting local businesses, supporting local writers, and uh, just you're going to get yourself straight into heaven. So. <laughs> now... Um, after the reading today, um, Jonathan will be signing up at the front at the glass case, and the line will go toward the back of the store. So after he's finished tonight, we'll lead him over there, and then uh, you guys can line up and get your book signed. So, um, well, now it's time to introduce Jonathan O'Dell. Uh, you loved A View from Delphi. And he's going to read from his brand new novel, The Healing. Please give it up for Jonathan O'Dell. Good evening. Good evening. It is a very interesting feeling looking out there at you. This is like people from every little compartment of my life have shown up in the same place. So I don't want you talking to each other. <laughs> Probably also, you may have heard some of my stories before, but I'll tell some of them again. Um, this is the second novel, and I was really thrilled to hear so many of you applaud for the first novel, that you have read that. I was wondering who had bought that novel, and I could all show that together. Um, can you hear? Is, is the mic more an annoyance, or is it helpful? If I talk without it, does it? Need it? Okay. Great. This novel, which came out last Tuesday, is, um, is the second in a, kind of a series. The first one, The View from Delphi, uh, it was published in 2004. It was, uh, writing the book was a lot about reconciling with my, with my parents, my mom, my dad. Hazel was well represented in the book. That was my mom. Um, and getting back to the South and saying, you know, I hate the South, I love the South, but I am the South, so I need to go make peace. And that's what the first book was about. The second book is a continuation of that. I was able to go deeper into, the, the, in a way, the psychosis that we're brought up with in the South, that black-white thing that all of us deal with, all us Southerners deal with. And just so you know a little bit about my past, how I came to even write, was I was, if you can't tell, I've got a Southern accent. <laughs> I grew up in Mississippi, a little place called Laurel, Mississippi. I was born in 1951, and the day that I was born, Four blocks from the hospital, where my mother was giving birth to me, there was a lynching at the courthouse, where a thousand white men and women stood on the courthouse lawn waiting for the execution of a man named Willie McGee, who was a black man accused of raping a white woman. Um, but if you go four blocks the other direction, you'll come to the Chisholm Mansion. And that's where a young Leontine Price cleaned ceramics cleaned the bathrooms, until the owner of the house, Mrs. Chisholm, heard her sing and got her into Juilliard. And then if you go the other side of town, south side of town, you may see Sam Bowers. He was my, uh, one of my Sunday school teachers, man about town, up-and-coming businessman, owned the amusement company called Sambo's Amusement Company. 
He was only a few years away from being the imperial wizard of the KKK and convicted for the atrocities that you saw in Mississippi Burning. That was Sam. So that's the place I grew up at. It was half black and half white. And northerners have a hard time thinking about the South. They like to think of the South as black, white, good, bad, victim, and it's so much more complex than that. It's, uh, people talk about, oh, you grew up in the South, it was segregated. Yes, we had legal segregation, but in a town of 20,000 people with 10,000 blacks and 10,000 whites, you can't segregate them. We were in each, each other's lives every day. They were in our kitchens. We were in their yards. We played together. They were our gardeners. So we saw each other. The problem in the South that I grew up in what, wasn't the physical segregation. It was the psychological segregation. To have something like Jim Crow exist when I was growing up, you had to teach children not to see black people as people, only as functionaries, as the background to our life. So I grew up in this white bubble. All those things that I told you about that happened when I was born, I didn't find out about until I was 45 years old, going through an old newspaper that was printed the day that I was born, and I saw Willie McGee there. I said, oh my God, and I looked at that picture of the thousand people standing on the lawn. Those are my teachers, my Sunday, my Sunday school preachers. That was my neighbors, my parents, my friend's parents. And then I looked, and his cover was on Time Magazine. The lynching was on Time Magazine. It was on Life Magazine. There were riots in Paris. Jean-Paul Sartre got involved. Einstein got involved. Faulkner got involved. And I said, well, how did I miss this? This happened four blocks from where I was born. So I went to my mom and dad. And I said, Mom, tell me about William McGee. Who? We don't know about that. They were psychologically blind. We, the stuff didn't have anything to do with our white story. We had a very sanitized white story that was based in superiority. <coughs> I didn't learn until later that that superiority was based in somebody else's silence. Um, I moved to Minnesota in 1980. Hey. And uh, I sobered up. I was a, uh, I mean, that's how I got through living in Mississippi as a gay man. I, you know, I just was drinking all the time. And I recommend that to anybody who's having to grow up in Mississippi as a gay man. <laughs> But I got to Minnesota for a geographical cure that actually worked. I uh, took a job and sobered up. And six years later, I was actually dealing with my own brokenness, which you got to do in recovery. You know, you got to go inside and say, well, maybe the world is a tough place, but I've got some bruises and some wounds inside. And one of mine uh, really stood out one evening in 1988. I was watching, it was the 20th anniversary of the, of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And here in Minnesota, there, were a lot, there was a lot of talk about that, a lot of questions in the press. You know, is the, is the dream still alive? Is the dream dead? We always ask that at some landmark of Dr. King's. On TV that night, they were playing these old films from the 1950s, 1960s, and, t and showing film clips of towns I grew up in, film clips I had seen from Walter Cronkite when I was growing up. And they were films of Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and Stokely Carmichael walking down these streets, marching down Mississippi streets. I could smell the dust. I mean, I was there. But for the first time, I didn't watch the marchers. I looked at the people on the side of the street who were throwing the rocks, who were waving the Confederate flags, who were throwing out the profanities. And then for the first time in my life, it hit me. Oh my God, this isn't just black history. This is my history. That made me who I am. And for that one moment, if you ever had a transformational moment, you know what I'm talking about, where your whole worldview is shattered, and you, it's scary, it's exciting, but you realize nothing that I've been taught before about myself is true. It's rooted in a lie. The next day, thank goodness, the Star Tribune had an article. There was a, um, the feature writer had called all over the country asking people what they thought about Martin Luther King's dream. And there was one woman who was so eloquent. She was, she, she was a black woman from Falcon, Mississippi. And she was the mayor of that town. And she, I noticed she was the exact same age that I was. So I didn't know what to do with this newfound liberation. So I called her up. Found her number and said, Miss Smith, are you the mayor of Falcon? She said, yes. And I said, uh, I have got a feeling, you know, we grew up in the same state together at the same time, but I think we grew up in two different worlds. And I believe that your stories may have helped create who I am, but I don't know what your stories are. Can you 
tell me. She says, honey, do I have some stories I could tell you? Come on down here. So I got on a plane. I went to Memphis. I rented a car. drove into the Delta. And uh, I said, well, you're a mayor, so things have really changed. You know, us white folks are always looking for positive things. Your racism is over now, right? And uh, I said, good, you're mayor of this town. She says, honey, there are 300 people in Falcon, Mississippi, 299 black ones, and the white one lives on the other side of the tracks. She said, no, it hadn't changed. So she told me stories about her mother, her father, her grandfather. She took me by the hand and took me to people whose stories she thought that I should hear to better understand. It was so different that I would understand by listening to black stories, I would better understand who I was and how I got what I got by these people's sacrifices. I talked to sharecroppers. I talked to people who had walked with Dr. Martin Luther King. That composed the first book, those stories. When I, after I published the first book, there was one story that kept haunting me. A group of people that Miss Smith took me to meet, and they were 80 and 90, they were elderly ladies, 80 and 90 year old midwives. <coughs> and I had been taught that midwives were nothing but dirty, they were superstitious, they did silly things like bury the placenta under the bed. They would do things like, or bury the placenta and then stick a knife under the bed to cut the pains of the labor patient. It, oh, that's cute. Um, but when I talked to these women, when they talked about these midwives, there was this glow in their face. There was something that I was missing. So after I wrote the first book, I said, I want to go find out what it is that I'm missing about these people. And um, I did some studying. And I found out that midwives in the 1930s and 1940s in Mississippi and after the Civil War up until the end of Jim Crow, midwives, black midwives, were the only people who birthed black babies. White doctors wouldn't touch black flesh. So they depended upon these midwives. And what I discovered was these midwives didn't just see birthing as a physical act, they saw it as a communal act. And the whole community was involved. It was about place. It was about here we are. Here's who we are. The thing about burying the placenta, if you can imagine that as a black man, where you slept tomorrow night depends on what the white man says. <coughs> you can be moved around even during sharecropping days. People could be packed up and moved. There was, they had no say-so over where they stayed. Can you imagine how powerful it would be for a midwife to take that placenta and bury it and say, you are rooted in the world. What a communal act, what that says to the whole community, it binds their story up which is what they did. They took care of the community story. When I did even more research, I found out that these women, these midwives, didn't just start after slavery. They were the most powerful people on the slave plantation. The most powerful blacks on the slave plantation were the midwives. Psychologically, if you can imagine, when the white doctors were called in to tend black flesh, they treated them like livestock. And their goal was to increase the resale value, get them to, to produce more, and stand up longer in the field, just like you would an animal. But when a midwife tended her patient, she named them mother, father, child, uncle, aunt. She differentiated them and brought them into a community. So what I found was her healing was subversive. It was a way to subvert the power of the master. And the master's job was to break down any communal bonds that those blacks may have with each other so he could be in control. And the midwife went right against that. She was knitting them back together, trying to pull them together as a people. When I read that, I was... I was excited. I said, this story needs to be told before it's lost again. Um, in fact, when going back to the 1930s and 1940s, the reason why the midwives went away is they were pushed out. The white medical profession started seeing public monies flow to help poor people. So the white medical establishment at that time wanted to get control, and the barrier they had to taking over the black population were these midwives, because they were saints. So they passed laws in the legislature for accreditation. They had to be able to read. They had to, had to pass certain tests. Many of these women were illiterate, so they were pushed aside. Then they started writing articles in medical journals talking about the abortion rates, talking about their dirtiness, laughing about their superstition. I found one journal article in 1935 which actually went out and tested some of these hypotheses that were being thrown out. And their results were that the live rates among these black midwives were twice what the white doctors were who took over their... And you know why. And the midwives were in the community. They knew about what her mama was like, what her grandmother was like, what kind of special problems this family has about birthing, what their food was like, what they needed. They were, they were in that community. 
So that's when I really got to realize, well, that's another chapter of black history that white superiority is trying to get out of the way as quickly as possible. And then the more I studied, I find out that these traditions trace back all the way back to a tribe that I found in Sierra Leone called Timney. And that's, I decided I'd base a character who came for with that thread of, um, of knowledge, of that wisdom, could trace it back all the way to the time before, to the time before remembering. Um, I was really lucky, but I got this information. All I needed was a face. I just needed a voice. I needed a hero. And how many have read the book so far? And how many uh, have bought it but haven't read it? And how many are here just to see if you want to buy it or not? <laughs> I'll try not to give a lot away. But um, there, there was a woman, a midwife. Her name was uh, Mrs. Willie Turner. And she was in a place called Midnight, Mississippi. And I called her up. She, she was deaf almost. So she couldn't really talk on the phone. She had to get, we had to make arrangements, so I had to get her daughter to talk with me on the phone and then yell at her mother. And it was this, this man wants to come get your story about being a midwife. I could hear in the background, oh, yes, Lord, yes, yes. <laughs> and I found out that she had been sitting there without being able to tell her story to anybody for 30 years because nobody cared anymore. And that was her life. So I came to her that day, and she was dressed in a bright yellow dress. She'd gone to the beauty parlor, 91 years old. She grasped my hand, and I just knew I had found my hero. I mean, I was, I was so deeply accepted by that woman at that moment. So we spent the rest of the afternoon. I, had, I would write down questions because she couldn't read them, or she, she couldn't hear me. Then she usually couldn't read my writing, so I ended up shouting at her. Her daughter, who was 70 years old, who had better ear, had been more lung power than both of us, was shouting. So she was shouting at me, I was shouting at her. We spent two hours just yelling at each other. And this woman had the most... Wicked sense of humor. I mean, wicked, wonderful. I said, did any baby, did, did any woman ever fight you? She says, fight me? One woman bit me. I said, I said what'd you do? I slapped the Jesus out of her. <laughs> and her husband was there. And her husband said, don't hurt my wife. I said, hurt her? She done bit me. <laughs> she was just... The thing about her, too, she was in charge. I, I could have been a white man. I could have been the sheriff. I, no, it didn't matter. That woman was in charge. She knew what she was doing. She knew what she was called to do because God put her there, and you better not tell her to get out of the way. She was that powerful. At the end of, the, at the end of our talk, she looked out the window, and she says, yeah, she says, I, birthed, I caught 2,063 babies just in this county alone. And she looked at me, and she says, and every one of them still calls me mother. And I was like, okay, that's, that's the story. How, many, how much knitting and bonding did she do with community to give them that sense of self, that soul? So uh, she became my Polly Shine. Uh, one last story before I read a piece. I want to read one piece and then open it up for questions. I really like the give and take. If you have questions, you can, or impressions. If you want to tell me how wonderful I am, you can do that too. But, uh, <laughs> It's my night. <laughs> so, <laughs> after this, I go back home to Mississippi, and I'm not sure how happy they're going to be about some of the stuff I'm writing. So I'll take all the love I can get. Um, I had a friend. So I had a friend when I began. I, I really wanted to write white characters because I'm a white man. And I'm really sensitive to people saying, well, why are you stealing black people's stories? And that is a real thing. Black, white people do go out and steal black stories, and then they make a fortune off of it. So it's they do the pain, and we do the gain. And I really try to write white characters. But for some reason, I can't write what I know. That's boring. I write what I'm drawn to know. And the most burning desire that I have is, how did the black story create my story? Where did they come together? And so I'll end up with black characters. Well, I have a friend, you may know him, Don Samuels. He's, um, we used to have a company together called Authentic Dialogues, and we would do race talk with, with, with petrified white people who didn't know how to talk about race. <clears throat> so uh, he said, <clears throat> okay, you're going to write about black characters. And I said, yep, I do. He says, do, do me one favor. And I said, what? He said, do not write another To Kill a Mockingbird. And I said, that's... To Kill a Mockingbird, that's beautiful, that's Pulitzer. I mean, every white liberal loves To Kill a Mockingbird. He says, I know they do. Every white liberal loves to see one of them going out and saving one of us. He says, I do not want my children to read one more book 
where it's a white man, a white woman who is so victimized they have to have a white person to save them. What does that teach them? If you're going to write black characters, make them a scoundrel, make them a crook, make them a blasphemer, but make them a human being with two feet on the ground. It was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And that's where Polly came from. I, uh, I wanted to have a black hero that needed nothing or take nothing from white folks. But I wanted her to be written in a way that she could be a hero to all of us. Not just black folks, but white folks too. And hopefully, I'm achieving that. This is, uh, in case, just a little summary of the book. Uh, where, where we'll land with this reading is that Polly has already come to the plantation. And the reason why she comes to the plantation is that the plantation owner is losing slaves to an unnamed disease. He's called the white doctors. They fail. All they can do is perch, purge or bleach them or bleed them. And they die even faster. So, so he, he, he likes to breed his own blacks, his own slaves on his plantation. That way he can make them docile, he believes. He doesn't like bringing them off the plantation because they may be troublemakers. They may have been around abolitionists. But he breaks his rule. He goes off the plantation. He's heard about the slave healer up in the Carolinas that has magical, mystical powers. They can actually heal diseases. So he pays the sum of $5,000, which is unheard of for this slave healer. Her name is Polly Shine. She comes to the plantation and immediately starts to turn things upside down because she knows she's got what the master has to have, an answer to the sickness. One of the first things she does when she's there, she looks across at the big house and there's a little girl there named Granada. She's only 12, 13 years old. She's been what they call house raised or house bred. When the mistress's own daughter got sick and died, she went crazy. And to get even with her husband, who she blamed for her own daughter's death, she went out to the slave quarters and took a black infant, the blackest one she could find, and raised her as her own daughter. Dressed her in her dead daughter's clothes, paraded her around like a clown in front of white people to torment her husband. So when Polly sees this Granada standing over there, he said, she says, you promised me an apprentice? That's who I want. And of course, Granada doesn't want that. She's been bought off. She likes the white style, even though she's caught in this perverse, per perverted kind of dysfunctional family. She does get attention. She does get nice things, and that's all she wants. Um, but Polly gets her way, so Granada has to go to the hospital. That's where Polly they built Polly a hospital so she could tend the slaves. And this is her first encounter. But you can imagine Granada standing at the door, looking inside seeing what she's getting herself into. <clears throat> Once she regained her senses, the first thing she spied was the evil woman standing by the hearth, testing something from a pot hanging from an iron hook in the fireplace. The bone-thin creature was singing to herself, apparently unaware of the girl's presence. Polly Shine had fixed up the hospital, and like the woman herself, it was peculiar in a disturbing kind of way. Gourds and clay pots hung from the rafters in concentric circles. Coiled grass baskets, their lids securely attached by ropes, were stacked on the floor. Stalks of plants Granada didn't even know the names for were bound with string and looked to be growing out of the corners of the room. Hanging from the fireplace, pots boiled with vile-colored liquids. In the center of the room was a work table piled high with cloth scraps, string, and bottles of colored glass. A row of pallet beds ran along the floor. Collecting her courage, she said from behind her hand, What you wanting me for? Polly said not a word. In fact, she appeared to take no notice of the girl at all. Maybe, Granada thought, the old woman was half deaf like old Silas. The girl raised her voice. Why I got to be here in this stinky place with you? Polly Shine went about her business, mixing ingredients from her sacks and gourds in the boiling pots. Granada remembered the picture of the evil witch stirring a big black kettle in one of Little Lord's fairy tale books. This time, Granada cupped a hand over her mouth and shouted at the top of her lungs, How come you ain't talking to me? Not looking up from her pots, the woman shouted back, Because you ain't worth wasting my breath on yet. She resumed humming her tune. Aunt Sylvie say you evil, Granada said defiantly. 
And my mistress say you is a mad woman. Huh, your mistress say I'm mad? Polly still had not taken her focus from her work. I think I done seen your mistress. Ain't she the one who goes around with a monkey shitting down her back? <laughs> Polly threw her hands back and cackled wildly, setting the tiny disc to jingling. Granada crossed her arms in protest, but Polly went on about her business with little regard for Granada's bruised feelings. She decided to become as tight-lipped as the old woman. Granada held her silence with, until her muscles in her jaw clenched. But the woman still refused to tell her why she had asked for her. The girl could stand it no longer. If you ain't going to talk to me, why don't you let me go back to the great house with the mistress where I belong? The woman crooked her scrawny neck and looked at Granada with a delighted grin. Belong? She repeated. That sure is a big word, ain't it? It's a mouthful, that word. Be long. Her tone was now mocking. The more you chew on it, the bigger it gets. Chill bumps rose up on Granada's arms as those yellow eyes peeled her back and peered into her again. Why you think you belong there, she asked Granada. You want to sit pretty perched on your mistress's other shoulder like her monkey so everybody can laugh when you play the monkey for the white folks? Ain't no monkey. Polly took her time looking Granada up and down. No, you ain't no monkey, she agreed at last. You is a damn sight worse than a monkey. You a house nigger that don't even know it. Them that work the swamps is better off than you is. At least they know they slaves. And y'all say I'm the one who is bought. Polly narrowed those piercing eyes at Granada. Where's your natural mother at anyway? Granada stomped her foot, but the woman only smiled. Then Granada spit at Polly Shine. I ask you who your mama was. Wiping her mouth, Granada said, Why should I care? I was picked out special when I was a baby, hand-picked and hand-raised by the mistress herself. That where you was taught to spit on the floor? I said, Who's your mama? I don't know, Granada said behind clenched teeth. Then you don't know who you is, do you? Might be a nigger or a monkey or a pet goose. That's what I'm talking about. The woman silently studied Granada for what seemed like forever. Polly finally said, You ain't never seen yourself, has you? I seen myself all the time in the mistress's gold frame mirror. What you see? You see that skin as black and smooth as God's night sky? Are them eyes so dark they can hold the glittering stars in heaven? Or that hair as rich and full as God's own crown? No, you don't see them things. You see the white man's gleam and sparkle looking back at you. You don't have no idea who you are. And if you don't know who you are, Polly continued, you can't know nothing about where you belong. I told you I belong in the great house, Granada said, looking after the mistress and, miss, and little Lord. So you thinking you one of them, Polly said. You thinking one bright morning that white woman going to bring you a satin wedding dress, marry you off to her pretty little white boy? <laughs> She'd probably throw you a great big party because she's so proud. Polly snorted loudly until she began choking on her tobacco. She hawked it up deep in her throat and then spit a stream that landed exactly between Granada's shoes. Granada stepped back and looked down with disdain at the mess the old woman had made. That's how you spit, Missy. Until you can best me, I advise you to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I'd love to hear any responses or any questions. Any, there are no dumb ones. And I also know this is a very sensitive topic when we start talking about race and slavery, etc. So I'd invite you to be clumsy. Don't feel like you have to say the right thing so you don't offend people. We don't get very far learning from each other if we are rigid like that. So anything that's on your mind, any question that you might have. It could be about me personally. I know when to answer those and when not to. It can be about my writing process. My publishing process, I have, I'm thrilled to have my agent, Marla Russoff, and her partner, Michael, here tonight. They, uh, the angels who saved me, found me. So, and so, but if you want to talk about my relationship with editors or with agents or with anything about the book, I'd be glad to answer your questions. We'll skip the first question because that's always the hardest. Let's go to the second one. <laughs> Okay. How you, your background, um, how you got into this, and how you, the 
book. Okay. Um, I promise you, by the time I finish answering this question, I'm going to forget what the question was, because I think tangentially, one story leads to another one. I do, I like the idea of writing when I was a kid. I like that. It's something about, I had this image of sitting behind a desk by myself, writing, sending things out the door, and affecting people. And I never had to meet them. But, I, but that was powerful to me. And also, I wanted to be a playwright and sit in the audience and watch people react to my stuff. And I could be away from it. So I had that image, but I never wrote. Um, the first class I took was in high school. I took a creative writing course from Mrs. Harper, who was a fundamentalist Christian. That's redundant when I'm talking about it. I took it in Mississippi. But uh, she, I wrote a story that I thought was really cool. My first story I ever wrote, I wrote it about being embarrassed at a dinner party. We're eating spaghetti, and I, my manners were bad. I didn't know which fork to pick up, and the woman next to me kind of pointed to the fork. And, so I, I read this, this story to the class, and the class loved it. So, oh my gosh, we can actually see that. That is so cool. And I called the woman sitting next to me my savior because she pulled me out of this predicament. And uh, so Miss Harper listened to everybody praise my work, and then she said, well, I guess it's okay, but one thing that's really important, you never use the word savior unless you're talking about Jesus Christ our Lord. So I, <laughs> so I said, boy, writing's a dangerous thing. Go to hell for writing your own thing. So I pushed that aside and I said, okay, I'm just going to learn the things that have answers like math, science. So I went to college and I took an honors course. I was in the honors program and we had to take a poetry course. And the teacher made us write a poem. And, oh gosh, I, was, I didn't want to do it. I was nervous already. The, 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 I don't know about you, but exposing your writing to other people. I mean, I would rather do anything sometimes than let people know what I think on paper. So I did the natural thing. I got drunk and wrote, and wrote it that night, drunk. Uh, the next day I handed it in, and um, I got it back. That day I handed it back, and there were red marks all over it. Oh, crap. So I went ahead and doubled down in business. Doubled down in psychology, graduated, went on, started a company, uh, did executive leadership, that kind of stuff, stuff that you get paid for, stuff that, you know, this hard knowledge, you can be a man. Um, until I was about 45 years old, and I ended up being, I had more money than I ever thought I could have. I, you know, I had company cars, I had a beautiful home, my partner looked perfect in a picture. You know, and the dog was perfect. Spring, little cockers, good little Springer Spaniel. We lived in Golden Valleys where all the up and coming gay people were. And it was perfect, except I wanted to kill myself. I was just so depressed. So I went to my therapist and I said, uh, You know, I can make more money than I ever have. And um, I should be happy. This is everything my father told me. I should. He said, But you hate your job. I've been knowing you for 10 years and you hate your job. I said, what has that got to do with it? My dad told me if you found a job you only hate 95% of, you got a damn good job. <laughs> and I hate what I do, so I got a great job. And, and he said, no, you need to, something else you need to do. Now that you've made your money, you paid, you've made your sacrifice, there's something in you that's trying to get out that you've ignored. And do you know what it is? And I said, no, tell me what it is. He says, well, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, and the only way you're going to know is to quit doing what's making you sick and wait for the answer to come to you, because you can't chase it down. So I believed him. I shut down my company. I left my partner. I gave away my dog. I you know, sold the house. I went to the junk. You know, and I said, okay, I'm going to go overseas and travel, because I can afford it. I said, I think I'm going to go to, go, to, go to London, or maybe go to Ireland or Scotland. He said, no. He said, go to some place you don't speak the language, because you control the hell out of people. He said, what you don't know is you've got to be in a receptive mode. Go to some place where you have to ask for help. Go to a place where you have to depend on other people. So I went to... Costa Rica, spent three months in the jungle, stopping listening what was going out there and just trying to listen to this really tiny voice that got beat up so much, saying, I got a story I want to tell. They said, okay, here I am, 45 years old, I'm an ex-businessman, and I'm going to go write a, a children's book. <laughs> you know, and I went back, and I spent you know, four years writing. And it was the first time I can remember since I was five, getting up in the morning and saying, I can't wait to see what turns out today. So I knew, and it was, and it was bad. It was really bad. And I, uh, <clears throat> I wrote the book like most first-time authors do. It was a morality play. I wanted to get even with everybody that has ever been to me. So I wrote about my mother and how she was bad to me. And I wrote about my dad and how horrible he was. And neglectful. every bully that ever pushed me around, every coach, every teacher, they were all in the preacher. You know? And just so nobody would miss it, I named the kid Johnny. So it's really subtle. And uh, we're, we're talking about this story over... Uh, over dinner, 
So I, I really wanted to get my parents with this, really. And it was thinly veiled. And so I, uh, my mother was an alcoholic, and we'd had, and if, you read Del, if you read Delphi, she's bigger than that. I mean, she's, uh, she did turn the car over in the mayor's yard, not the sheriff's yard. She got drunk every Christmas Eve to embarrass my father. Uh, she, she, she went and got shock treatments one time. Um, and she liked it because the drugs they gave her later. She, you know, just, so she was just, she's a mess. I love my mother to death, but at that time I didn't have a lot of patience for her. And um, so I showed my dad the book, and he read it, and you could tell he was, the way those muscles clench. Then he finished it, and he came to the bedroom where I was staying, and he said, uh, Johnny, you can't show this to your mother. I said, why not? He said, we'll be hauling her off to Whitfield. <laughs> you know, she would give me more shock treatments. She would push her off the deep end. You know, he's, he was always scared she was going to go off. I said, I said, no, now if Oprah calls, I don't want her to find out on TV. Like, big chance, that's going to happen. So out of this, you know, sense of nobility, I uh, gave the book to my mother. So she sat in this Daddy's Lazy Boy all weekend long, reading one page after the other, one page after the other. By the, you know, by the second day, I was terrified. I, was, I shouldn't have done this to my poor mama. My caretaking role started taking over. I was afraid I would, you know, damage. Nobody can damage my mother, but I was afraid that I was. She got to the last page. She turned it over, and she started crying. I went, oh, my God, I really did hurt her. I said, Mama, it looks like you're having some feelings about this. She says, Johnny, she said, that was the best book I ever read. I love the story. She said, only one thing. Now, with my mother, that can turn the world on its head. She says, only one thing. I wish I could have been that little boy's mama. Oh. <laughs> that, um, if I could be anything other than an author, I would be a narcissist like my mother. It's like, don't get affected by anything. It's all about me. And that's good. So, um, so I, then I gave the book to my writing teacher, and I was really proud because I had tortured this little boy named Johnny every way that I could. And that's how you make readers read books, right? You torture the character, make them cry. So I, I did everything. I even killed his dog. I had him molested. It was, it was brutal. Um, I, but I was proud, and I took it to my writing teacher, Mary Gardner, and in her, in her usual tactful way, she read through it, and she says, in the middle of it, she says, you know, Johnny, if, uh, if one more bad thing happens to this, this kid, I'm going to kill him myself. <laughs> so, so that was the greatest learning that I had about writing, is that when I have an agenda, I need to stop writing. There, there, there's a saying is, uh, sometimes you need to stop writing even before you begin. And that's when you have a reason, you have a goal, you have an agenda that somebody needs to feel something because of what you write, especially talking in fiction. And so she loosened me up from that wheel of self-determination, and she gave me the characters alive. She says, you know the most interesting person in this? She said, your mother. I bet you're supposed to hate my mother. She said, no, she's fascinating. She rides around drunk and Lincoln, and she dresses really pretty, and she's sassy. And how did she get to be that way? And she says, this maid. You know, you, white Southerners always talk about their mammy and they go on about how, lo how she loved us and, you know, all this horrible stuff that you hear out of their mouths about, you know, they're just like family. What was her last name? Well, we never knew her last name. But um, my maid I hated and she hated me. I only had her for a year and I ran her off. I stole things and blamed it on her and told my mama and so and so. So my maid was angry in my book and she had a character. And my writing teacher said, now, I'm interested in this woman. How did she get to be this way in 1950s Mississippi? Like, she stands up for herself. What was her background? She said, back it up 20 years and give me the characters. And when she did that, my agenda fell away. And these characters took over. They wrote the book. It was the life was there. The same way with this book. I, I wrote this whole book without Polly Shine. And it just laid there dead. I wrote with Granada and with the Violet, the girl she's healing. In 1933, it went on to like 1940, and it was dead. And there was one throwaway comment that I put in here saying, and Grand Grand was thinking, you know, I'm trying to remember how I learned this. And it was the old, the, the old woman who came to the plantation taught me, when Jim read that, he said, that's your book. And I said, but I don't want to write a slave novel. Everybody writes slave novels. He says, it's not a slave novel, it's about that woman. So that's where the energy, finally I was able to drop my agenda again and just follow this character and let her write the book for me. So, whatever your question was, I hope that got close. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know,
another question? I'll try to be shorter the next question, but I'll promise that. Yeah, I, I do like working at the loft. I don't do most of the writers here know about the loft. It's just a great organization. It's where grown-ups get to go and not feel stupid for writing because everybody's in the same boat. You got nurses, you got mothers, you got everything. Everybody just has. Everybody seems to want a story, and you can go there and not get humiliated and really talk to some really good authors. So I hope to be doing another class there this fall. So if that happens. Thanks. Yeah. When can we expect it? Oh, uh, well, they're about coming about eight years at a shot now, so <laughs> I may be out of my social safety net by then. I'm not going to I do have another book. I don't know how it'll end up. I've got 100 pages, and I've got the characters that I want to work with. Um, I, they're not working together right, but I really like the story. I'm actually going to really try to write in a man's voice this time. I say that with every book, but it never happens. And I've tried to understand why that is. That's another thing if you're a writer. you got to write in the voices that come to you. You can't be picky. If you get some voice comes to you and it's a turtle, you're right. <laughs> Maybe it's the only novel ever written in the voice of a turtle, but that's the one that came. And for me, it was I tried to write men's voices, but they laid down dead. But the women's voices, they just like start telling me what to do. And it's, I think it's because of the way I was raised in the deep south where I was raised, redneck south, is that the men didn't say anything. Unless they were drunk or they were preaching or they were running for office. You know, that's when they talk. <laughs> Otherwise, it was, ooh, ooh. Good, good looking crop. <laughs> What's the cotton price? V8? Yeah. Nice car. How long you had it? And so, at, at, these, at these reunions, the men would segregate themselves as the men sit on the front porch and the women would go back out to the kitchen. I was no dummy. I went with the women because that's where the stories were. The women in my family were hilarious, and they were storytellers, and they would tell stories on each other, about my granny, about their husbands in the most laughing way, about the neighbors, about who's, who's, who's baby and whatever, and it was like, it was, it, was, it was wonderful. And so I hung out with the women, and mentally took notes. And then in my own church, the Southern Baptist Church, between Sunday school and church, the men stand out on the front porch, and they... They smoke their cigarettes, talk about the football game, and what little small animal they killed over the weekend. And then inside, the women stay with those huge hats, those beautiful flowered hats, and, the, and they'd be talking over the pews, those hats just bobbing up and down. And they'd be laughing and talk, talking about the most unchurchly things. So when I started to write, I was really, you know, these are my women. These are the women who shaped me. These are the women who define who I am, and I need to honor them when they come to me. So women may take over this book too. That, I'm willing for that to happen. I'm going to start out. I try. I've tried to write as for a gay kid for like three books. I try to get a gay kid in there, and it's I'm too close to it. It comes across as rigid, and it comes across as pedantical, and it comes across as lecturing. It's not fun. So I'm going to try to put. A, I, I wrote a series of columns from my hometown paper in Laurel, Mississippi, this little town, and um, and I went to the editor and I said, you know, a lot of gay kids are killing themselves. And I grew up in this town and almost didn't survive. I want you to, if you care about these kids, let me write a series of columns of what it was like growing up gay in this town. The paper was nearly firebombed. I'm serious. A preacher who had the nerve to say, we shouldn't hate the sinner, we should only hate the sin, lost his church because he was too liberal. That's the kind of town that still exists in Laurel, Mississippi. And so I think I'm getting a little less subjective about it, so hopefully I can work a gay kid in the story, because re there's a story that really needs to be told, especially in the South. Growing up. Great question. Any, yeah. I was fascinated by the fact that an important character in this book is a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> where, where did you find Daniel Webster? Um, it came out of the product of Amanda's insanity. I needed a way for, for us to remember that she was insane. Also, even though it's heavy-handed, I realized that, that she cared more for the monkey than she did for Granada or her own child. She lavished attention on that monkey. And, so, and also they named it Dan Daniel Webster. I would have had it in the book even just if they had the name Daniel Webster because that's where the South was with the North at that time. 
But yeah, it, it, it was serviceable, and I didn't know that it would play out as well as it did down a few chapters. It was one of those lucky breaks, but I needed to show some kind of, I needed to get some, some compassion going, so it played really well. Thanks. I'd like to sing your praises, so... Okay, um, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a mic? <laughs> um, obviously, you have a lot of um, book writing fans here, but we, um, a lot of us here from St. Kate's, which... Yay! <laughs> Actually, do you guys want to raise your hands? St. Kate's students? Oh, cool. Um, so we're all nursing students, and we were assigned your book as part of our curriculum, and I want to make you aware of the change that you're making for the nurses, because your book is assigned as part of our um, family maternal nursing, uh -huh. and we are... Um, the healthcare direction right now is going into not focusing on just the patient, but the entire family, and that's right. so much of your book. Oh, so, um, you know, you're really going to touch a lot of people with this, and I, any nurse that I come across, whether it's 20 years down the road and I work with them, I'm going to tell them to read your book. Because <laughs> that's great. It's wonderful how that comes full circle, because I don't know if you know the story. When I was first writing the book, I was really tentative. I mean, I'm a gay man. What do I know about women having babies? And that's not something I really wanted to learn, either. But the story, the story kept going there, so I said, I'm going to have to you know, bite the bullet and go learn. And I had done some work with uh, Marsha Bird at that time. She had read Delphi and used that as a collaboration, the way to talk about race. And I said, can, can you pull together some professors there? to read an early draft of this book on the healing, and I need some, some, um, some professional feedback. What's off, what's on, what would be helpful, and also I know that there's a midwifery program going on on campus too. So St. Catherine's, they're in the back of the book. I mean, I acknowledge them very highly, and it's so wonderful to come back and do the full circle, come back home again. You're Thanks. making a big difference. So. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and another thing about the writing process, I envy people, I envy my partner Jim, where are you? You'll hate me. He's over here. So handsome. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, I just want you to see him. <laughs> now, he's, uh, he's, he's one of those people who can, well, he's, I guess multitask is so trite now, but he, he's an artist. So he can get into a painting. And with the other hand, he's over here doing 3D work. He works with a peace organization in Burma. He also loves dinosaurs and does replicas. The man, he has to have nine different things going on at the same time. That's where his creed. I have to have one thing and one thing only. And to get the characters right, I have to go away. I've got wonderful, what I call cabin fairy friends. They give me their cabin, and I can go by myself for a week at a time and get really close with the characters. And because of what I do, I actually take characters into my own personal family because I've done so much work with great therapists here around uh, family systems, and that's how I think. So I put these characters into my family and see how they react. And it's, it's an interesting process, but I've got to be alone to do it. I, just can't, I can edit anytime. I can spend 18 hours a day editing, day after day, anywhere in the coffee shop. But when I'm creating for the first time, I'm good for two hours and I'm exhausted. The other time is just research. And I need to sleep it and I need to eat it and it needs to be just, I need to be inside of it. Mainly because my self-concept is so rotten. I mean, truthfully. If, if I sit down in a room by myself, I, I'm my own worst enemy. So it's got to be safe around me. I cannot go in and out of that space. Yes, I dream all the time. Yes, yeah, and uh, the name of the first book came from a dream. I would say that was I was doing this dream course where you write down questions that you want. I said, okay, why do I name the town? That he said, I said Delphi. <laughs> so, how are you going to argue with that? <laughs> Didn't sell that many copies. Maybe my dreams aren't worth. <laughs> but that's what. Yes, and so sometimes I don't dream the characters. Just link with the emotions. You know, feeling grief or whatever. Thank you. It's a, well, a psychoanalyst, right? Yeah. Yeah. One more question I think we've got time for. I'm 
Yeah. Okay. Was there an inspiration for Polly? Was there somebody that kind of gave you a spark? Yeah, talked about her a little earlier. She was, um, in fact, I'm glad you brought that up. Her name is Mrs. Willie Turner. She was a 91-year-old midwife I spent two hours with. I taped the conversation. Random House thought it was worth, you know, editing up. It's on my website if you want to hear the conversation I had. With, that, that is Polly Shine. The wicked and the humor, the in control, the irreverence that she was, but the wisdom and the respect and the knowing what she was doing and where she came from. That was, uh, that was my inspiration. The other inspiration came from, uh, I don't know, if you, you may have heard of the WPA project, the, the, the ex-slave narratives in the 1930s and the, the, during the Depression. They paid a lot of out-of-work authors and writers and photographers to go talk to ex-slaves before they died and get their narratives. So rich, because they write it in the vernacular, and some of them do a pretty good job. So you get the music. And also, you have to realize, white people are interviewing these ex-slaves. A lot of these white people used to own these ex-slaves. So they don't tell the truth directly. Blacks around, in the, blacks around South, blacks around whites in the South have to be very versatile with their language. When they praise, that's when they sass in you, or etc. So you have to read between the lines, but it's it's a genius of uh, dialect, and genius, a genius of language that we've lost. So I tried to put that in her mouth, too. Yeah. So, um, oh, cool. Uh, this is Majors and Quinn, <laughs> and they are a part of a dying breed of companies, of uh, businesses in this independent bookstore. But they are also the, uh, the backbone in the community to, get to bring people's <laughs> voices out, to support writing. And I hope that you will uh, frequent them tonight at the cash register. And if you don't want my book, buy another book. But uh, also I want to thank Gary. Is Gary around? Gary? Oh, Gary Mazzon. He's doing his job. He's the outreach guy. So I want to thank him also for making this possible. And also thank you for coming. It's just wonderful to look out and see people.